Dr. Don Davis is a phenomenal gentleman who himself has found like a lot of us. And stackers, I know you're all talented at a bunch of stuff, which means we peel off often way more than we can actually juggle. And that's when we start to get into trouble. So I felt like a great way for us to begin 2023 was with a look at overwhelm and speaking with Don Davis about his new project, which we'll talk about specifically about avoiding overwhelm and taking a scientific look at this was a great way to start. Instead of a good motivational speaker, I think having a scientist talk to us about overwhelm is great. I'm excited about 2023, but I have to tell you, Don, that when I first heard about this book and about your work on this book, that I thought, man, this describes me overcommitted. <laughs> like, I, I can't be the only one telling you that, Don. I feel like it's a lot of us these days. No, and I, you know, I, so I, I write the book from the perspective of, I, I, you know, I also am somebody who's overcommitted as well. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it fits it fits us both, but also probably a lot of other people that are listening to this as well. And, you know, I sort of call myself a, a long term overcommitted who overcommitted person who's trying to stay committed without being overcommitted. <laughs> so, well, yeah. you, you describe your life in one sentence, I think near the beginning of the book as a three ring circus, which sounds very much like mine here, in mom's basement making podcasts. <laughs> but, but tell me about you and your personal experience with overcommitment and trying to solve that. Yeah. So, I mean, just in general, um, the way I would sort of frame it up is that, I mean, the best way is that, you know, I have a, a very good professional career uh, and have had for for all of my life. Um, at one point, I was I was traveling to multiple continents, you know, sort of floating around the world. And in the midst of that floating around the world, I was teaching for, you know, two to three universities online. Um, you know, in addition to that, I had three kids at home. Uh, so frequently had a suitcase packed. There was even one point in time where, uh, I had, I had commitments with regards to my kids. So my kids had like sport, sporting events and things like that going on. In addition to that, you know, I'm, I'm sort of preparing my dissertation. So I've got, I'm at a, a, a sporting event for my daughter and I've got all of my papers for my dissertation kind of laid out <laughs> on the bleachers and, um, you know, laptop in my lap and, and my wife leans over and she goes, Hey, she's about to score. And so I'm like, you know, instantly look up, watch my daughter score, but you know, I'm missing out on what I would say life and missing out on key points that I wanted to, you know, also be attentive to. And that's what I try to deal with a little bit in the book as well is just, you know, I, I, I'm certainly not a perfect person and I uh, frequently sort of revert to these, uh, overcommitted, um, you know, elements as well. And so I have to just be careful and, and have a lot of guardrails in place for that. It's it, it's funny because I only laughed while you were describing that because I've, you know, you laugh because you want to cry because you're right. <laughs> We've got 50 things going on. But I think, is is it worse now coming out of COVID for most of us? Are we, you know, getting overcommitted? Because I'm so happy to see you, Don. I'm so happy to be talking to people. I'm so happy to be, you know, coming out of my cocoon. It feels like overcommitment, it's a ripe time for overcommitment. Yeah, so I, I'm working with a lot of different clients right now, and they, it, it sort of what sparked the idea in my head was this first point, which is there was a meeting with a client that was coming up. It was a very important meeting for that client, and I knew exactly what they would do. They would book themselves right up, right up to this absolutely critical meeting and not take the, the important time to prepare. And so I, I, I scheduled a meeting with a client and essentially showed up 30 minutes in advance of this most important meeting and said, look, this meeting actually is not for me and you. This meeting is for you to prepare because I know if I just leave it up to you, what's going to happen <laughs> is we're going to show up to the next meeting and you're going to be preparing the first part of the meeting. And I need you to show up with answers to this meeting and not like waste, you know, 25 people's worth of time. We need to sort of come into this meeting really strong and, and know exactly what it is that we want to do instead of having time for you to get caught up in things like that. The next 25 minutes for this 
session essentially is for you to do all that preparation. We're then going to go to the next meeting. And I know that you're going to come in there prepared because you're not going to use this time for anything else. You're going to use this time to get yourself ready. And in sort of that moment for me was that initial spark. I have coaching clients as well, you know, that during the pandemic, they were saying, you know, hey, look, I feel like I'm, I just got way too many things and they're leading to a point where I don't necessarily want to go. And then the last part was my daughter, I saw her kind of, you know, committing a lot of the same sins that I've committed as well in my life where you have important things going on with your kids plus your professional life and everything else and you're trying to figure out how does it fit in. It's best to first figure out what you want to do and then figure out how to fit things in versus doing it the other way around. And so those three things, those three elements kind of came together as, hey, look, right now is the time for this book. And, you know, from it, I saw that, you know, even Microsoft had conducted a study and saw that there are three peaks that all of us now have in work that that we do based on a lot of the, the data that they're collecting from the Teams app that they have. And they saw during the pandemic that we all started 8 a.m. There's another peak that happens after, you know, your local time, lunchtime. And then there's a third peak that happens in every single day that happens around 10 or 11 o'clock with a oh, lot no. of professionals as well that all of a sudden came about because of the pandemic. So to answer your question, very long winded here, but yes, that it, it uh, there is a third peak now in everybody's work day. I, I want to ask you just, I'm just so curious. What did that client say when you told them, Hey, I'm not meeting with you. This is your prep time. He actually said, thank you. Yeah, he said, uh, I think he took a, I think he took a breath whenever he first, you know, heard it, you know, trying to figure out like, should I be mad? Should I be, you know, shocked? Should I, but I mean, at the end of the day, he just came back and said, you know what? You're right. I would have showed up, you know, to that meeting very unprepared. And, um, you know, I appreciate the time. And so, so thank you. So, I mean, one of the things that I call out in the book actually is time blocking. So, um, you know, I said, you know, look, if you just leave your calendar up where people can see it and like book t- book time more readily, they will fill your time for you. The, the right thing to do for yourself as well as everybody else in your life is to time block and sort of make sure that you have segments of time where you can prepare. And so, you know, he and I've kind of circled back, you know, later on and he said, you know, is there a better way to, to, you know, to kind of manage this? And I said, well, my suggestion would be find elements of time that you have during the day where you could say, you know what, I'm going to use this time as prep time. If I prepare quickly or if I don't need to prepare for things, I'll give the time back. I'll open it back up for people to book time. But you can hold that time so that people can't fill your calendar because, I mean, this guy's calendar was like beginning of the morning to end of the day, sometimes, you know, going way late in the day uh, full. And he just would have never had the time to prepare otherwise. I found time blocking work for me done, but, and, and by the way, before it was a thing, I just realized that to-do list weren't working. And so I just said, but if I put up my calendar, I look at my calendar all day long, what do I got to go to next? And if I just make a date with myself, it works. It sounds like you're saying that from a much more scientific nature than the way I did it, time blocking is, is a, is a good strategy for a lot of us. Yeah. Yeah. I, I found that for a lot of my, uh, you know, coaching clients as well as the professional clients that I, that I work with, you know, on a daily basis, it definitely works for them. Um, you know, interestingly enough, I have one senior executive who has told his entire team that they're not to book any meetings during lunch hour. Well, that was the only time that they had available. And so those individuals now are sort of struggling with how do they manage the expectations of the executive versus, you know, what they need to do, you know, and, and we'll see how this all plays out. I mean, I still don't fully understand, you know, whether or not if, if they'll, you know, continue to book meetings during their lunchtime. My, one of my podcasts, I have two podcasts. I have one that focuses on life sciences and one of them that focuses in on the food you should eat daily. There's a doctor out of Canada that said that he wanted a podcast. And so I frequently get on, on the air and talk, 
you know, to him about things that we should do. One of the interviews that I interestingly did did with him was that you should be taking time out to eat you know, more appropriately because it, it helps kind of your mental state and, and other things. And um, one of the things that I had said to one of the doctors that we had on and interviewed was, well, I frequently drink my lunch and not meaning alcohol, by the way. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was going to say, I've had, those, I've had those days, Don. That's, those are good days. <laughs> I frequently would have, have a, a, you know, a, one of the meal shakes uh, is, you know, yeah. what I would frequently do. And then, uh, you know, I wonder why I carry around all this extra weight. But one of the reasons why this doctor had said that was that your body needs that time to like chew and process and, and other things, you know, to be able to, to appropriately prepare the digestive system. So if you're if your meal doesn't really have a scent in preparation and things like that, you're kind of, you know, completely depleting your system here of, of the opportunity to help you. And so, you know, again, eating lunch while eating probably isn't the better a better way to to use your your time during the day but you know again i think some of us are kind of forced into ways to, you know how do how can i make sure i get the right amount of calories per day plus you know uh provide the nutrients that i need i'm trying to find the yeah. words for it but yeah um and and so that was one of the you know things that they suggested is you know hey just take the time to make sure that you eat as well it is interesting, though, that bad food, you know, in our bodies is a part of being overcommitted and maybe drinking too much is a part of being, I mean, and I'm being serious Yeah, that it truly is like, you know, you're, you, at the end of the day, if you're, listen, if I'm going on Microsoft Teams at 10 PM, I might self-medicate with a drink <laughs> at the end of the, at the end of the day. But you do look at this much more scientifically than some of the motivational people we have begun prior years with, which is why I wanted to talk to you. You talk about the three dimensions of commitment. Can you walk through this structure with us so our stackers know exactly what you're talking about? Yeah, so I, I with regards to time, you have to think about the the time that you have available how you're going to use that time. And then lastly, you know, what the, the, the third dimension is really like your processes and systems in that time. What this brings me back to a little bit, which I think will be easier to, to digest a little bit um, overall is my definition of overcommitment. So whenever you think about the definition of overcommitment, it's easy to look at somebody's calendar and say, hey, look, you're double booked or triple booked, which, by the way, we all know, you know, isn't really possible you know, for us right. to be in two or three places at once. What are we, done? an airline? Come on. We can't be, <laughs> right. we can't be double booked. Exactly. I'll sell the same seat two or three times. Right. Exactly. But the the in addition to that element of like having having time stacked, you know, one thing on top of the other, the other thing that I would also say is that you could be overcommitted into things that you don't want to work on as an individual. And so a, an example of this would be let's say that of of all of the things that I want to work on uh in a in a given day, I have some family time and then I have some uh, professional time out of that, out of those two elements of time, what exactly is it that you want to do with those elements of time also has to be worked into that over commitment, right? So I could be spending 90% of my time on my professional life and 10% on my personal life, but I actually want a closer balance between the two. And a lot of people talk about work-life balance, but I, I sort of say that, you know, as a person, we are also multidimensional in that same way, in that we probably have a lot of different things that we want to do. There are personal things that I want to work on that has nothing to do with my family. And then I have personal things that I want to work on that has everything to do with my family. So those sort of, you know, elements also have to be worked into this thought process of how do you use your time and are you overcommitted in one thing versus another? Boy, what a great time to be thinking about this today. Like it sounds like there's some planning involved here, but where do I start then, Don? Right. So I sort of I I walk through this process in the book of starting with setting out those categories in your life. What categories 
do you want to work on? I mentioned two of them just a moment ago. I have four. These are my personal four. They're not really, you know, they don't have to be anybody else's personal four. Uh, and I try and sort of, you know, walk people through having categories in your life and developing your own words for these. But here are my four personal, professional, financial, and fitness. So those are my four. Uh, categories. And under those categories, then I have goals. I have things that I actually want to do related to each one of those. And then under each one of those goals, I have tasks that sort of, you know, roll up to the goals. And so um, the best way to walk through this is to, you know, first set categories and then secondly, work on, you know, having, you know, goals that support those categories, you know, as well. What happens then? Then, you know, back to overcommitment. So then is that is is that my framework so that if something then doesn't show up on this list and it ends up in my inbox or on my phone, whatever it might be, that's when I say no, if it doesn't fit those four categories? So a lot of us wind up in this situation where we're having to figure out what is the balance between the things that I want and the things that I have to do, right? So I mean, yeah, we, yeah. we all sort of have to walk this tightrope. And there's something on my website, anybody that's out there can go to my website and I have something called the Overcommitment Dare. And so what DARE stands for is delegate, automate, reschedule, or eliminate. So the, it's an acronym. Um, oh. And so you can take the DARE for free. There's, no, you know, you don't have to buy the book or anything like sure. that. You can, you can go take the DARE without the rest of the book. Um, but I would think that the book would also support you a little bit better in terms of having the right structure in place first. Um, but what the dare does is, is you first sort of have to, once you know what it is that you want to work on, there are ways that you can color things in your calendar and things like that. I go through this in the book, how to technically set it up, you know, whether it's Outlook or Google, uh, Gmail, um, you know, you can go through actually setting up your calendar so that you can see how many of the things that you're doing are contributing versus other things that are on your calendar that are not contributing to the oh. things that you want to work on. And then secondarily, you probably have some things that you have to shed, right? So you, <laughs> I'm, I mean, I, people are, are frequently that the people that, that are in my life are frequently around me going, I don't understand how you do all this stuff in a day. Well, I mean, one, I have a lot of systems and processes that I've developed over the years that help support my lack of overcommitment, I would say, at this point in my life. Um, but they, I also sort of, you know, tell people that, you know, the number one thing in working through this overcommitment dare is to, to sort of take it in chunks and walk through and go, am I actually doing things the right way or do I need to delegate some of these things uh, would be the first thing. And delegation to me is a two part thing. There are some things that I could say, hey, Joe, is this something that you could help me with? And, you know, maybe delegate it to you or between us. Right. I mean, maybe it's not something I have to entirely hand over. Uh, I had somebody come to me with a last minute deadline the other day and they said, hey, look, and it's like nine o'clock in the morning by noon, could you turn this around and, and give me this deliverable? And it was a big deliverable for them. And so I said, well, actually, you know, I can, sure. Let, let me, let me, you know, take this on and, and deal with it. And so when, when they came back, they said, well, wait a minute. So you went to two other people to help you get the answer. And I said, yeah, you wanted it in this time frame. I, as one individual, probably couldn't have done it by myself. But with my team, you know, I was able to quickly turn this around and hand it back to you. And uh, they were a little surprised. But, you know, they delegated to me. I turned to my team and delegated to them. This <laughs> sort of this chain of events that happened. Um, but we met the we met the goal. I didn't become overcommitted. I still delivered on everything that I needed to that morning. I could have cleared my calendar maybe and done it myself. So that's just one example. I but I love this idea, and I want to I want to halt for a moment there because uh, I found that in my own life. I remember. I'm in my personal life with my kids, they were part of a swim club and, and it was delegated to me to oversee something. And I got partway through it. And the president of our club, Don actually came to me and he said, Hey, how's it going? I said, well, it's going great. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. 
And he puts his hand on my shoulder and he goes, Joe, when I put you in charge of this, that, that wasn't for you to do it all. And I think many of us do that, right? We internalize it. Don puts me in charge of a project. I think, man, I got to do that. And I don't think who else around me stands to win if this goes well. And there's often other people that are invested in the project. I think that's pretty powerful stuff. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's a big part of change management as well. I mean, one of the things I'm trained in as well as is change management inside of organizations. And one of the biggest, the, one of the biggest parts of change management is who else is in the boat with you. Right. Yeah. And yeah, um, yeah. so a lot of these things, whether it's personal or professional sort of things that we're working on, I mean, oftentimes by having other people with you, it builds your sort of your overall support for whatever it is that you're working on as well. It's and it ends up being better for everybody. I mean, it's better for the swim club if I don't do this all by myself. <laughs> you know, it ends up being a being a better thing. Uh, by yeah. the way, people that heard my disappointment when when you talked about the dare wasn't that wasn't that I was disappointed by the survey. I just want to be clear. I was disappointed <laughs> because is is the URL overcommitment dot com slash dare is that. Uh, it is so. The best way to get there is to go to drdavisphd.com and then um the the link the, there's a link right there where you can take gotcha. it gotcha if you want to go to the overcommitmentbook.com that will also get you there both of them gotcha. will land you in the same spot I, I i own both so yeah i will i will link to that but my disappointment was i thought you were referring to a dare where i dared to become overcommitted and i'm like i'm already winning that dare <laughs> yeah, right. so i was disappointed that that wasn't what you were talking about that was the, the the deal but i love this because i like the assessment at the beginning um i want to ask you about w one more thing here because uh it seems uh antithetical to the whole premise of overcommitment, which is you write extensively about the role of time away, right? In the middle of the entire plan, you talk about taking time away, which seems anti-everything. I mean, you don't get further ahead of your job. You don't get further ahead of your life. You don't keep the pedal down, right? Like how is how does time away help you succeed? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that I actually deal with a little bit early in the book as well is just this idea of burnout. So uh, we don't talk about this a lot in the United States, I know, but it's a big global uh, sort of thing. And the, the, I was actually, you know, on interviewing somebody yesterday for one of my podcasts and she brought up be burnout as well. But this idea of burnout is just you have so many so much that you're just, you know, pedal to the metal all the time without a break. It essentially leads to a point where you can't sleep. You don't feel like eating. You also, you know, really cloudy in terms of your ability to make decisions and really execute. I mean, at the end of the day, that's kind of the worst thing for somebody that's already overcommitted. Um, but at the end of the day, it's our mind and our body's way of saying, Hey, look, you, you can't stay awake 24 seven. It's not possible. Uh, you also can't, you know, work pedal to the metal all the time. And then you actually start to find out that by taking breaks, even if they're short breaks, I mean, I also talk about meditation as well as a part of the, you know, one of the chapters of the book deals with, you know, the idea that, you know, I start my mornings every morning with a little bit of meditation. I also journal in the morning because I find that it helps me think about the things that I did yesterday as well as the things that I've got to do today. Um, those things really help me sort of set out the the real thought process process for the rest of the day. And so whenever, you know, whenever I woke up this morning, one of the first things on my list was this interview. Right. I mean, you know, thinking through, OK, do I have the link? Do I have everything that I need to be successful? You know, whenever I join you and, um, you know, those things really start to help me with this process of what I have to go through for the rest of the day. But also, like I said, people that watch, you know, all the things that I execute on typically in a day, they're just like, I can't believe that this is how, how much you actually get done. And, um, and it's just a matter of, you know, I start my day with, you know, this kind of process of, you know, making sure I'm ready for the day. I love this idea, though. You use a word in the book that I think we need to talk about more often, and I hope we do in 2023, and it's replenishment. I love that word, Don. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is a way as well. I mean, getting to take vacation... <laughs> 
which, uh, you know, oftentimes, you know, I mean, you think about the pandemic, some people, some people that I know actually left the country, um, you know, to go somewhere else during the pandemic, which, you know, was available to them all of a sudden because they were entirely working remotely. And so, you know, I have a client that that's in Canada that went to uh, Mexico for a part of the pandemic and then kind of moved around throughout the pandemic. And she constantly was updating me on, you know, here's where I am now. And so it was a lot of a lot of fun for me to get to see somebody take vacation, but also leverage the opportunity of being virtual and just saying, hey, look, I'm going to I'm going to use this in a way that's beneficial for me. And so she described her day as, you know, look, I work my normal work hours, but, at you know, in, in the mornings and at night, I mean, we truly are on vacation. This is, you know, a true break for me. And um, I mean, I thought it was fantastic to, to leverage it that way. But I also think there's a danger there. I mean, I'm with you. I think that is super cool. But one of the results of COVID that you know is is this idea that we're not returning to the workplace like we usually do. And every study that we've talked about on Stacky Benjamin shows, people really want this hybrid workplace. But how does a hybrid schedule affect your work-life commitments? Because I think if you're not intentional, like this could be a disaster. I completely agree with you, but I also think it is a way for companies to better define what it is that they want from people as well. And in and, and an opportunity for em- employees to come back and say, hey, look, um, you know, this will lead me to a point of, you know, I'll have to, you know, commit a lot more hours than than there are available, you know, currently in the workday. One of the things that I mean, I was head down, heads down for the, the book itself, you know, sort of writing through a good portion of the pandemic. And so with all of that, whenever I lifted my head back up, there was this term of quiet quitting, right? And, um, and I think it brings back this, the same sort of idea, which is that should you as an employer be allowed to sort of dictate to people what they do? every day, every hour of every day of the week. So let me kind of start there. Um, there are a lot of people that have, let's say, Etsy stores, YouTube channels, podcasts, <laughs> a variety of things, but the lo- they love their job. They don't, they aren't necessarily building a second way of being employed. Now, if they're super successful, they may have to reevaluate that at some point in time. So I think that would be fair as well. Now, with that, I think that there, there is a real opportunity for employers, though, to kind of come back and say, you know, I'll do I'll do this hybrid thing. But my my thought process in terms of your output is this and and then have a discussion with the with the employee right i mean i i, I think that it needs to be much more output and, and goal centered than anything else and i've worked with virtual people most of my career so i i kind of find this you know bigger debate a little interesting as well because i've seen people work a lot harder whenever they're remote and yeah. and output a lot more uh, than whenever they're in the office as well but that's also what scares me is that is that you know you and I have been working remotely for a long time and I have set these barriers but I'm just afraid there's a lot of people that are hanging out with us that haven't established those barriers yet and, I, and I'll tell you you just have to be super intentional about that when the day's over you've got to find a way to block that off because otherwise it just you know that 10 o'clock at night thing you referenced earlier Don holy cow <laughs> right <laughs> don't, yeah. don't want that there has to be a way where you where you say, hey, look, this is my time to cut, you know, to, to cut it off as well in terms of your work day. But you also, on the other hand, I mean, I remember whenever I first started, uh, my my kids were young, uh, started working remotely. My kids were young and uh, my wife was at home. And I remember she would, you know, sort of run in between things and then say, you know, hey, look, I'm going to go do this. You know, do you want to go do that? And I'm like, I'm. I'm working. I mean, essentially, I'm in the office. I'm just not in an office. And so, right. um, you know, having those boundaries helps helps as well. And, and, you know, it takes a little bit of understanding on both sides. Uh, it was exactly the same. I had I had a friend who told me uh, her name is Alice. She was a wonderful mentor. And she told me, Don, she said, 
make sure that you set the, just set the expectation of the people around you that you are at your, your quote office, like you are at the office, but after five o'clock, you're no longer at the office. And by the way, if you run out of stuff to do at two 30 in a particular day, stay at quote the office for the rest of the day. Cause they won't understand which, which has right. been by the way, fantastic setting these same times that after five, it's great before five I'm at the office. Cause and, and, and by the way, I only know that because I violated it. And, and when you violate it once, all of a sudden your spouse goes, Oh, well you took off the other day in the middle of the day. Can't you do that? <laughs> right. to, to, you know, to catch you do that today, the book is called overcommitted, how to transform your habits and achieve the life you desire. Uh, what a great way to begin 2023. Don, where do we get the book? So it's available in all your favorite bookstores. You can also find it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble online. You can buy the ebook, or I have a hardback that's also all color on the inside. Um, and so, yes, yeah, it, it, you can find it everywhere. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, and uh, happy New Year, man. Let's stay under committed this year. How about that? That sounds great. Thanks so much, Joe.